to Hilly. This is something uh -huh. that we're missing now in the floodplain is you, you don't have these high water events that will help knock those species back and you don't have the, the prairie fires that help knock them back. So they've been growing really uncontrollably uh, on the floodplain and especially in the cottonwood forests and choking off the understory. So the, the difficulty we had walking through here in many of the cottonwood forests, it's three or four times more difficult than that because they're so thick. Um, this is dogwood here and you can see that that also can get to be a really thick type of bushy plant, uh, but it was also intolerant to the high water and it's been killed off as well. Cottonwoods are showing an impact of being inundated with water for such a long time and the probable weakening of their root system. Uh, we have a cottonwood tree over here that's laying on the ground and it, when it fell over about a year ago, it was a, a perfectly healthy cottonwood tree full of green leaves and so on. But the root system had been weakened from being inundated under the water. And you can see that the way that it fell, the tree didn't, itself didn't snap off. Uh, the wind blew just hard enough to actually tip it over, bringing the root ball and everything else up. So you can see back there in the, uh, sort of in the red cedar, you can see that big root ball on the end of the tree. That's not typical of a, a tree that, that falls over in a storm. Usually they'll snap off somehow, but this one, basically the, the roots gave way and the whole root ball just came up because of that weakened root system. So the problem is that with that weakened root system, they can't stand up to the winds like they, these cottonwood trees normally would. You can see the impact on many of these other trees that otherwise look perfectly healthy. You can see how over there it's leaning bad, over here it's leaning bad, and back in there there's several of them that are leaning bad as well. So the problem is that with that weakened root system they can't stand up to the winds like they, these cottonwood trees normally would. Now I, I hope that they'll probably recover and regenerate uh, if they can make it through the next uh, couple of years. So here is a really good example of some extraordinary beaver activity. You, we, you don't usually see this along the river, but being this extreme. And it actually happened right after the flood. We're not sure why, but there's areas along the river, not only here, but all the way up and down the river, where you'll find these pockets of beaver activity that were just extraordinary. The one thing we do know is that the flood drove a lot of the mammals, including the beavers, out of the floodplain. So it drove them out of their, their native habitat. They were forced to go further inland. And some of them we found even ended up like up on top of the bluff, which is areas where they've never been in before just to get away from the water. So we don't know if, if this was some reaction to the flood or uh, something else, but what we do know is that we've got some extraordinary activity going on here after the flood. Are they back now? Yeah, uh, most of them are. Okay, so yep. they left and came back then. Yep. So this is a little bit higher than you normally would see. Uh, they usually were maybe only two or three feet high, but uh, because of the magnitude of the 2011 flood, they got made higher. But what's unique, what's good about this is that on the other side of it, there's also water flowing. So it's a sandbar out in the middle of the river, and that makes good habitat for the types of birds and uh, animals that like to be protected from the predators that are on the shore. They sort of become isolated here on this sandbar. there's these backwater channels inside between them and the high bank and so it, it's creating a lot of new natural backwaters along the river. Clear back into here for probably a quarter of a mile uh, this is all deposited by the river on the inside of the bend over the last 50-60 years and it just keeps working its way this way. Um, this was sort of the, the, the interface between that accretion ground and the river 
real low-lying, uh, new accretion ground. And for about a mile out that way, for as far as we can see, it was this huge wetland complex before the flood. The flood came in, and you can see how high the water was. Right, the flood brought in these big pieces of driftwood and so on, so you can imagine the amount of flow that's going through here. But it also, you know, the, the flood waters were, came roaring down the river, and when they got to this inside bend area, they slowed down a bit, and then the sand dropped out. It couldn't carry the sand anymore because the, the water stopped. So as a result, this huge wetland complex just got buried underneath several feet of sand here. We now have sand dunes instead of wetlands. This, uh, this, all this ground in here for here about half a mile north is in a conservation easement. So it's a really good example of lands that have sort of been set aside and preserved along the river. It guarantees they're not going to be developed in any way. It keeps them a natural river habitat. This uh, area here though, you can see looking up there, this will be one of those potential new backwaters. So when the river elevation comes back up to normal levels during the summer, there'll be a couple feet of water back in here and it'll be a nice backwater area. And this is a good example of a cottonwood forest and how it regenerates and how it would have regenerated uh, back uh, before the dams were put in. And the initial trees that we see here are pretty young. They're probably in the <clears throat> 10 to 20 years old for these cottonwood trees. But as you walk uh, further back into the forest, you get into older and older classes of forest. So then you get into 20 to 40 and 40 to 60 year old trees as you walk back in there. So this is, this is a good example of, first of all, when the Missouri builds its sandbars, normally it, you know, in the past, it hasn't built them quite so high, and it's built them lower like this, and this is why they became vegetated so fast and potentially became islands. Um, this area here, though, with the way it's taken off, it could potentially become new cotton forest. Uh, we're far enough away from the, the channel now that this will probably have at least a few more years of growth before it, the water comes this way. <laughs> so this could be the next generation of forest here. So it's really changed the environment here. Instead of being these uh, shallow channels of water moving through in between the, this network of islands, it's really just one big sandbar connected to the land surface. So that makes a big difference for what goes on here ecologically in terms of uh, animals surviving because you know now the, the, the larger mammals and so on that are, live up on the land surface are, can easily get out here and hunt with some of the smaller mammals. This is the Gunderson backwater. So this is what you saw them dredging when they built the sandbar out here, which is now covered over by the floodwaters and flood deposits. But what it is, is it's about a half mile long, and it's actually a former river channel of the Missouri River. The river used to flow through here back in the uh, 1950s and early 60s. It actually flowed through this area. And then it, it shifted off to the west to where it's at now, and this was just a backwater. So it was the, the former channel was a backwater. They came in and dredged several feet off the bottom of this, and now it intersects the water table again and it's a functioning backwater. You can see normally where the water level is. It's usually up there, so that's probably four or five feet deep normally. They used to be separated. Uh, but now the river has cut a channel in right on the other side of those trees and that channel connects this to the river on the upper end and it also connects the upper backwater to this backwater. That if the river continues to erode away at that area that it would erode all the way up through these backwaters and, and uh, take them. This little piece of channel here goes all the way up to the river which is just on about where those cottonwood trees are. So now you've got a connection from the river into here that feeds those moon shape, half moon shaped backwaters which are up in there, but it also connects into here. And so what that'll do is that when the river is higher, is it'll allow current to actually flow through here. 
totally changes the dynamics of the backwater. These backwaters are unique in that they exist at a state park. And so it's very accessible to the public. And one of the things that we try to do is educate the public on the importance of backwaters and wetlands uh, along the Missouri River because so many of them have disappeared over the last 50 or 60 years that are hard to find. So this is one that sort of showcases how beneficial a backwater can be. And it would be a shame to lose these because it's so highly accessible to the public.